Uh, is that working? Okay. Uh, Sir, Sergeant Major, just super, super appreciate the, the opportunity to, uh, to speak to this audience and to be honest, uh, honest about it. I'm, I'm nervous as hell. <laughs> <laughs> to be sandwiched between the, uh, the Sergeant Major of the Army and the, uh, the Chief of Chaplains, I said to one of the moderators yesterday, I, I, hope I, I hope I do okay, I'm really nervous. And he said, sir, you can't, you can't mess this up. And I, I said, don't, uh, don't sell me short. <laughs> so so it's, uh, it's, really, it's really an honor. And I'm hopeful to share uh, a perspective from a brigade combat team from the Sergeant Major of the Army's point. I'm hopeful to share a commander's perspective that will be useful um, or at least, at least thought-provoking to, uh, to this audience. And I do, I do think it's important, just first and foremost, until yesterday, I had no idea the level of investment that our army was putting into our force. I had no idea that there was this discrepancy between resourced and un unresourced units, and so my, my perspective is first and foremost, and just to recenter, and I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, and I know this is just a statement of the obvious, but first and foremost, the, the health and holistic fitness of our force is a function of leadership. It is a function of culture. It is our climate. It is about putting people first. It is about readiness. It is readiness. And you could make a mistake or you could, you could misunderstand in, in forums and venues and conversations that it's, a, that it's about a process or a product or um, a staff or, or whatever, and it is not. It is mostly, in my uh, observation, frankly, about staff sergeants. Um, the health and holistic fitness of our force is about staff sergeants. Um, okay. I would like to take just a second to frame, to frame our approach um, and to sort of give background on, on, why, on why our brigade, an unresourced brigade, I had no idea until yesterday, and on why our brigade's approaching our H2F programs um, the way we are. So about two years ago, two and a half years ago, as a student, as a newly arrived student at the Army War College, I was in a personal state of crisis, for lack of a better word. I, I was sequestered with three teenage boys. Uh, my wife was sequestered with me, and she loves me with all of her heart, but that's an awful lot of time together. As a, uh, as a military professional who I've spent all, all of my life all of my sense of purpose at war, nine Christmases and 27 birthdays, and I could see the war coming to an end, and I'm sort of asking myself, like, was, did that have any value or utility? And what do, what do we do next? What do you do with a brigade combat team if it's not get ready to deploy? So, so th sort of this, this personal anxiety, this personal and professional trying to redefine my, my sense of purpose, I was worried about our nation in the context of COVID and the insurrection and racial and civil tensions and, and all of those things. I was walking into the War College not the most optimistic leader. But a couple of things happened. The first of them is an Army senior leader came to speak to us. It was non-attributional, but you'll know by the words who it was. An Army senior leader came to speak to us, and he looked at us, and he said, you must lead your brigades in a way that inspires trust. I can remember like it was yesterday. In a way that inspires trust in our nation, in our institution, and in our army. And that trust is far more important than any CTC rotation or any live fire or any collective training event that you think is important. So that, that's like a little light bulb that went off. And then the Sergeant Major of the Army came and spoke to us. And... Uh, <clears throat> equally as eloquently. And he, he sort of described that it was not people first or readiness, but achieving readiness through a deliberate investment in our people. And that was like, that was like another light bulb going off. And then I took the, took the time 
uh, both sort of looking at my children and thinking about my future soldiers. And I just had a son, I know I'm not unique in this, I just had a son enter service, and so that's, that's obviously thought-provoking, so I did a lot of reading and a lot of research into the pressures that are pushing on our young people differently today than in the past. And we spoke about some of the symptoms of these pressures yesterday, and I'll just tell you, they're all real. Everything that you think is real, it is not a function of like the, the old dogs kicking the, you know, like the damn kids these days. It's all real. All of the anxiety, all of the suicide ideation, all, all of those trend lines are going in the wrong direction, just like your intuition tells you they are. And so I spent a lot of time uh, with Sergeant Major Fortenberry's team down at, at that time at uh, Fort Benning at West Point um, and with some other sort of critical teams that, that think about these things. And, and we sort of came to a modeled conclusion that the investment in our people must look like building cohesive teams as, a, as an end state not as a byproduct of collective training, but team cohesion as an end state. And we talked yesterday that we've got legions of young soldiers who have never played sports, and we tied it to athleticism and physical readiness, but I would offer to you, we have legions of soldiers who have never passed the ball, and who have never passed the ball to, to another or, or received it. They've never experienced failure, perseverance. They've never gotten up and sort of, they've never experienced all of those other intangible things that come with playing youth sports other than just athleticism. They've never been on a team. And then we also sort of observed that we've got to keep things hard. And if there's this cultural, if we're sort of in this cultural space where we want to soften the edges and make things easier, we must Resist the temptation. We've got to keep things hard. And I promise we're going to tie this, we're going to, tie this to H2F because from a brigade combat team's perspective, it's all the same. And I'm going to just step past a couple of slides. This next one builds. It's great. Okay. So, so we found a theory. Stepping into brigade command, we became pretty turned on. My Sergeant Major and I, Sergeant Major Chris Clappen, became pretty turned on to Robert Meachenbaum's stress inoculation theory. And most of us know intuitively what this is. Most of us, by virtue of being military leaders or athletic trainers, know intuitively what the stress inoculation theory is. But it's worth, it's worth just revisiting so we can have a common language for the next couple of slides. Developed in the mid-1960s by a clinical uh, psychiatrist to help people overcome stressful events, the first part was the clinician or the coach or the leader must, must develop a trust-based rapport with their patient, athlete, or subordinate. You've got, there has to be an interpersonal relationship and an interpersonal trust, and that's why it takes time. And then the second piece of, of the stress inoculation theory is, is the lecture portion. It's the, it's the teaching of the coping mechanisms. It's the teaching of the stress coping mechanisms. And then the third part is you have to practice. There has to be the practice in a simulated environment, and that simulated environment should feel like a little bit risky, uh, and it should, it should feel like a little bit stressful. And then the patient or the athlete or the soldier should experience perseverance with reflection of the person that they've built that trust with. And so if you do that iteratively, most of us know this intuitive, if you do that iteratively, you become a grown man or woman who can withstand life's daily pressures. Okay. So we, we took a very, very deliberate approach to try and implement a training curriculum to help our soldiers under the umbrella of H2F, withstand stress. And we called it the, the Sky Soldier Toughness Initiative. So in partnership um, with our R2 performance specialists, <clears throat> we developed a curriculum that we conducted at the organic platoon level, and we had our R2 performance specialists spend time with, uh, with platoons and teach them what I would call 
an MRT light curriculum. So not the full 40 hour block of instruction, but we sort of cherry picked the master, the most applicable, what we thought were the most applicable master resiliency coping mechanisms to platoons at a time. And then we were real deliberate to connect that block of instruction uh, to the hardships they would experience in collective training, live fires, road marches, CTC rotations, what have you. And then we, we would talk about it on the back end. So we, we, we did a series of assessments before the intervention, um, like grip surveys and road marches and five mile run assessments, like all of the, all of the assessments that you can think of. We, we came up with those before and then we would give it to the, the, group, the intervention group about six months later. We did this three times. The first, the first iteration, three prototypes. The first iteration was, was pretty small. It was just literally to see if we could do it. Can we just get the R2 our, our performance team to focus on one platoon and to make that one platoon better? So, antidotally, this first prototype went pretty well. But we're just an infantry brigade and we botched the data collection a little bit. We, we felt like it went well, but in terms of collecting data, you know, we're just like a bunch of like, it's me to first lieutenants and staff sergeants. We're not like rocket scientists. So our second, um, our second iteration, we went from one platoon to four. The primary benefit of this in retrospect was like consensus and buy-in. It became part of our brigade's battle rhythm. It became part of a thing that we were talking about in training meetings. The battalion commanders figured out that it was important to me and it wasn't going anywhere. And so the second iteration, frankly, didn't go as well as the first. The antidotal feedback wasn't as good. We could see the dilution of scaling. We could see that the R2 performance folks couldn't do as well with four platoons as they could with one. And we only got moderately better at data collection. Okay, so our third iteration, uh, we tried to do really well. And we partnered with the Department of the Army G1 Resiliency Directorate. We tweaked our assessments into some really pretty quantifiable uh, measures. We really tailored the POI. We overlaid this thing on top of our long range training calendar with the classes at exactly the right point and these, these challenges. And, and, and we really sort of wove it through our calendar as artfully as we could, and what we found, to be completely honest, was no change or impact at all. We had, we had built a study as best we could of 20 control groups and 20 intervention groups that were blind, not double blind, but blind to what we were doing, and there was no change in performance, there was no change in SIR generation or assault or any, not any of the data that is available to a brigade commander, we made no impact, which was discouraging. So we tried again. And the second time, we tried with our chaplains. And so what we asked our chaplains to do was to design a curriculum uh, called Tough in Spirit. And we again took the stress inoculation theory, and I apologize for flipping my slides here and trying to get on the right one. So we asked our chaplains to design a curriculum that if you can imagine, if you can imagine strong bonds uh, conducted in an outward bound like setting in organic rifle platoons over a 48 hour period of time in an immersive environment that is sort of harsh and so the, chaplain, the chaplains take the guys and gals up into the woods and they climb mountains and they talk about life's purpose and they talk about it iteratively through the engagement and then after the engagement and then through a series of, of follow-ups. And again, we, we iterated this. And the first iteration, <clears throat> we asked four, so I've got six battalions, we asked four of our chaplains to design a prototype. And design a prototypical curriculum with an associated cost and to do that. And so each of these four chaplains took a platoon out and spent some money, which was completely legal and legally reviewed, um, just for the record. And, 
And then what we did was we surveyed very, very subjectively, just surveyed the troopers that participated to, did you like it? Did it, did it do anything for you? Did you feel good when it was done? And we called that the utility, and so we had cost and utility, and we found an optimal model, because obviously we've got these four chaplains, and each of them thinks their prototype to, to minister to the flock is the best one, so we had to mathematically say, hey, this is the one we're going to go to, because we can afford it and still get, get impact. So then through the first quarter, sort of September and October, we asked each of the chaplains to take what has now become sort of a directed template. We leave, the, we leave the ministry, we leave the curriculum to the chaplain, right? There's just an, an amazing amount of power in that autonomy. But in terms of the design, the distance we want them to move, the time they spend together, there's a meal included, just the curriculum becomes pretty dictated. And we give that to the chaplains and say, do this. And that's sort of like this consensus, this consensus building phase. Three of the four didn't really want to do it. One of them was really, really excited. But we exit October of last year with, all right, sir, sorry, Major, that was, that, was, that was pretty good. And as we issue our annual training guidance for this year, October until this moment, we're in phase three. And what we're doing is we've, we've taken FM 7-22, Chapter 10, Spiritual fitness, and we've used that as our doctrinal underpinning to spend operational money on spiritual fitness, a lot of it, about $250 uh, per soldier. It'll be at about a million dollars for my brigade uh, this year, but the results, uh, the initial results are pretty, are pretty remarkable. So I've got six battalions. Four of the battalions, for, for various reasons, are all in. Those four battalions on that bottom slide to the left uh, are depicted as the, the left four sort of bars. Two of the battalions uh, have just not picked up the program um, as well or as quickly. Of the four battalions that have implemented it, <clears throat> there's been a 40% decrease in SIRs in those four battalions. Of those four battalions uh, who have implemented it, there's been a 60% decrease in sexual assault incidents, uh, harassment, and, uh, and, and the like, with no, no impact to, the, to what we'll call the control, the two control battalions. And then of the four battalions who have implemented it, we ask the chaplains to, to provide a uniform language for good counseling and bad counseling. And of the battalions who have implemented Tough in Spirit, there's been a 53% decrease in soldiers approaching their chaplain for bad counseling. Okay. Truth in lending. There's clearly, there's clearly a fair amount of bias when you're looking at battalion size elements. And there may be, there may be confounding variables like command, climate, and approach. And, and all of those other things may come together. So then what we did was we looked at the individual risk rate of a soldier generating an SIR. So in my brigade, each individual soldier on any given day has about, a, it's a little less, but I'm, for the sake of round numbers, it's a 1% chance of generating an SIR. So I go into work, there's a 1% chance, it's a little less, but there's a 1% chance that I'm gonna generate an SIR. So we're gonna call that our SIR risk rate. For the soldiers who have participated in Tough in Spirit, there's an 80, 3% chance, reduced chance, that they'll generate an SIR. And we, you know, we've got a couple of really, really smart guys on the staff, and we asked them to dust off their statistics classes from, uh, from college, and we ran the statistical square, chi square test. The, the relationship between tough and spirit and the reduction in SIRs, so I can't draw causality, but I'm 99% confident that there is a relationship. That's pretty significant. And so then we start looking at the dollar value of an SIR. So the, of the paratroopers who get SIRs, I've got about 75% of them 
they're getting separated. So if you do something that the, the two star reads about, there's, there's about a 75% chance that, that you're gonna get separated for that. So there's a dollar cost to the SIR. And so we looked at the total number of paratroopers who had been receiving SIRs, that equals a total number of paratroopers that were separating from the Army, and that has a dollar cost. And obviously, you can see where this is going. When you look at the dollar cost of the paratroopers that were separating relative to the dollar cost of 250 bucks per person to spend some concentrated time with their chaplain talking about purpose, it, it's a really, really what we think is a uh, remarkable return on investment. Okay. So then we, we start thinking really, really hard about master fitness trainers. <clears throat> Just a few, a few comments on the front end, and I, I understand the doctrine of this is, is evolving, um, and so my, my comments may not completely match, but, but it's what I've got. PT, and, and ma'am, to your point yesterday, PT is not about PT. And I know there's a lot of fitness professionals in here, so from a, from a brigade commander's point of view, Physical training is not about physical training. It's about awakening the warrior spirit. I would say that it's about leadership. I would say that it's about sharing experience. I would say that it's about being present. I would say that it's about showing up. I would say that it's about building little tiny cohesive teams. It is not about push-ups. The Army, frankly, doesn't have a push-up problem. The ACFT is a great way to measure whether or not we can do push-ups, but PT is about leader development. PT is a daily modality where our staff sergeants can train for 90 minutes how to be leaders. It's a place where for 90 minutes, people who have never been on a team for all of their lives, they can be on a team for those 90 minutes. PT is not about PT. And I would offer that being a master fitness trainer or an H2F coordinator is not about being, being a master fitness trainer. <clears throat> it's about instilling the expert power into our most junior NCOs. So whereas we officers have sort of our authority and power given to us by virtue of commission and rank, non-commissioned officers get their power through expertise. And the more expertise they can accrue, the more better they are to influence their young soldiers or paratroopers in whatever the task is. So we've tripled down on sending folks to master fitness school, which I think it may be what, like, I think we're consuming as many spots as we could, which may be of what got us this invitation. And the results are pretty good. So of the two battalions we measured, <clears throat> of the two battalions we measured, um, since we really started sending folks to Master Fitness School, there's been a 17% decrease. And this is, this is a little bit squishier math, but, but the pattern is still pretty, pattern's still pretty there and apparent. And a, and a 27% uh, decrease in, in profiles, just from sending uh, folks to Master Fitness School. But what becomes really, really remarkable is we can see, and I'm not quite sure how to measure this, but I'm telling you it's there, we can see the intangible effects of young sergeants who, who weren't necessarily super confident to teach something, who weren't super necessarily confident to lead something, but with this relatively easy skill and like, hey, everybody's gonna pass the MFT course and they can bring it back and now they're hyper empowered. Yes, our profile rates are going down, but we can see the manifestation of that expert power and empowerment across, across the brigade. And so from my point of view, I'm, I'm a little bit cautious to outsource any component of that. And though while we're 100% relying on, on you know, expertise and the evolving civilian domain and all of that, I really want my staff sergeants to be in charge of PT because it has transferability into everything else the brigade does and that's who's gonna win the next war. Okay, we can see, ma'am, again to your point, we can see these really, really good things happening. I don't know, I don't know how it connects. I can't, I can't draw a direct connection from master fitness training to behavioral health profiles. But I know that there are these trend lines that are happening at the same time. So they, there's gotta be something you know, like AI or some sort of deep neural network would be able to connect them in just a way, in just a way that I can't. So we, we're looking at, at our behavioral 
profile, behavioral health profile rate, not the number of times that someone goes to talk to somebody, not MFLAC utilization, not embedded EBH utilization, but the number of times the rate at which folks go on profile. And we looked at two periods of time. The first period of time being uh, January to September of last year, and then the second period of time being uh, October to, to right now. And what we're seeing is as we're investing in MFT, we're seeing that those EBH profiles have decreased 48%, 48%. But folks are still going to see the clinicians at the same rate. They're just not seeing them with things that would present to an EBH profile, which is, from our lens, really a big deal, because what's not on the slide is at least in our community, once you go on profile, your RTD, your return to duty rate, is about 8%. So once you go on profile, there's about a 90%, 92% chance that I'm gonna carry you on my books until I chapter you, separate you, or you ETS under natural conditions in a non-deployable status. So this is really, really something that we, we look at and we're, we're pretty happy with, but wait, there's more. As this is happening, <clears throat> the number of peer interventions for suicide ideation goes up. So we, we wonder, there's something happening in the background, and, and our definition of a suicide ideation is pretty low, to be completely honest with you. It's, it's as interpersonal as like, hey man, you, are you doing all right? That gets reported as an intervention. And so the number of paratroopers and junior leaders who are saying to their teammates and subordinates, hey man, are you doing all right? While profiles are going down, that number has gone up over the same period of time. So there's something happening where folks are, are seeing the embedded EBH profiles and the MFLAX, but the profiles are going down, but the peer, peer interaction is going up. It's, uh, it, it's pretty remarkable. Okay. So then the other thing we've really thought through, and I couldn't, I couldn't agree with the SMA more and uh, on the importance of the dining facility as a cultural hub, but the truth is from a brigade combat team's point of view, we eat in the dining facility, we're present in the dining facility, we inter interact, uh, at the time it was General Donahue's team at the Culinary Center of Excellence to make sure the supply chains and all of that were running well to Italy, and, and I think our dining facilities, they're certainly not perfect, and there's plenty of innovation to be done, but they're as good as is within our authority to, to make them. And so, we started looking at other modalities of, of nutrition, and we started, to, we started to think about alcohol. In the first quarter of FY22, as, as COVID in Italy came to a close, the, the sharp, the, what I would call the bad, sharp things were egregious as, as the community opened up and our young troopers started to, in layman's terms, pregame on post, go downtown, and come back to the barracks. Uh, in the, the first quarter of FY22, I was, I was pretty convinced that if the Army looked at my brigade, I'd, I'd, I'd be relieved because it was, it was atrocious. So we started to dissect the anatomy of, of an assault and there were a couple of components. One of, the, uh, one of the components we found was they don't occur uniformly, they occur in clusters. And one of the clusters was we had a group of like bad staff sergeants. So there's 23 of them. So we got tw those 23 staff sergeants out of the barracks, we just moved them out. And of, of course there's this counter argument that we need the staff sergeants in the barracks because in my day the staff sergeants instilled discipline in the barracks and that is true but the demographics of the barracks are not what they were 25 years ago. So we, we identified these 23 guys by name and out they go. The second thing we did um, was we negotiated with our local AFIS manager to shape how we sell alcohol. So specifically, we begged him, please stop the pallet sale. A pallet sale is like when you walk into Walmart and there's a pallet of things. The reason they do that is because it triggers a psychological effect where you buy more 
of, of things. It's just a visual, man, it's a opulence and quantity, and I'm going to buy more. So he said, hey, man, can you, can you please just not have pallet sales? Can you please not sell two liter bottles of hard alcohol? Can we just limit it to, to a 0.75 liter bottle of alcohol? Can you get rid of the impulse purchases, the little airplane bottles, at the cashier? And can you please stop the predatory pricing that undercuts the local vendor, who's a mile and a half out the gate, by the way? Can, can we just moderate how we sell, not all alcohol, but the hard alcohol? Because every single one of those sexual assaults is, every single one of them, is a woman who's blackout drunk. And he did. And it gets pretty good. So I would offer as our closing, or as close to closing, it is time, so if it's time to rethink Burger King, which I think it is, first of all, I love a Whopper, but it is, <laughs> I need one. It, it, it is time. It is time to think about and consider, if we're serious about the health and holistic fitness of our force, it is time to consider whether or not Burger King and hard alcohol in volume at predatory pricing at our profit, at our profit, is worth, uh, is, worth, is worth what we all know it's tied to. And believe me, I've been talked to. I've, I've, been, I've been counseled, Mike, you don't understand it's about money. And that doesn't make it better. That makes it like so much worse. God bless. Okay, so then the last piece is, I, I wish the Sergeant Major of the Army was still here. When he came and spoke to us in the, in the War College, if you remember on the first slide, I talked about the deliber deliberately building cohesive teams. I raid, raised my hand and said, Sergeant Major, how, how at the Brigade Tactical Unit do we build cohesive teams? And he sort of sidestepped the question and said, hey, sir, you gotta integrate people better. So we, we've, doubled down on, uh, we've doubled down on the reception, you know, the, sort of the, we call it RSOI, um, reception staging onward integration. It's, it's, the, it's the collection of folks and we don't have data. Um, we don't have data that says this independently has made a significant difference. But but I do think, and we've got plenty of subjective feedback via command climate survey, that how you receive people, and that you receive people well, and that we receive people will well with our best NCOs, and those best NCOs are connected to the Army programs of record related to sponsorship and those best NCOs have, a, have an open door to the command sergeant major, um, it, it just seems, it seems like we all know and it's, it's time to make that, that investment. So in, in closing, um, I would just offer, we've, we've certainly had a couple of missteps. Uh, H2F is about people first, it's about leadership. Keep things hard, make them harder. Um, build teams as a primary outcome. There are not different cultures. There's not an H2F culture and a fitness culture and a sharp culture. It's our Army's culture, and these programs are embedding mechanisms to the culture that we want. We should look at how and where and why we sell hard alcohol, and we need to super empower our chaplains because right back to the, tr uh, the stress inoculation theory, the reason we think that the toughness initiative didn't work was because the clinicians didn't have the pre-existing relationship with the paratroopers, and we think the chaplains do. And we think that's why, essentially, with the same curriculum, they're getting a little bit different effect. So, I re sir, sorry, Major, I, I super appreciate the, uh, the time and, uh, and the opportunity. Um, I, don't, I can't imagine there'd be any questions. <laughs> okay, sir, sorry, Major, thank you very much for the time. All right, you don't you don't get off that easy. Um, hey, just I, just one comment really, and and it's it's also a question as well. It, it, you had a slide up there. If you go back to, um, yeah, don't step off the stage yet. <laughs> Your stress inoculation theory, and, and and then also the tough in spirit. You know, when one of the things that Sergeant Major and I were talking about, um, and it's really just a comment because uh, you opened my eyes to something there. You know, we, in our world, we're looking at, you know, how, how do you build this, this kind of this toughness right from ground zero, right? So they arrive at your formations in Vicenza, Italy, and they're ready to contribute as a, you know, a valuable member to your team. And whether you look at this model 
or you look at the stress inoculation theory, what you have there in that kind of that lower left is um, this reflect piece that's there, right? So that, that third step or whatever it is, the last step there is you come around. And I don't think we, this is Klein's opinion, I don't think we do this part well enough. Give them the mission, maybe teach them a little bit about how they're going to do the mission. We run them through the range or the simulator, or whatever the case may be. And then we give them another mission. You know, it's this kind of the AAR piece, if you will. And there's so much to be said for the reflection piece. Even if it was, if you're not into journaling, okay, that's so be it. But even if we had our leaders that were going out and saying, what'd you learn today? How did that go? What was good? What was bad? Um, what would you do differently? Uh, just as simple as that, as they're walking through the barracks, they're walking through the training area, the motor pool, you name it, to connect the dots for the individual and let the individual reflect for a minute as a, as a soldier and then set them up for success again as they go around the, the loop one more time. And so that's just a comment. And, and I was wondering if you had, how do you do that piece on no matter what model you're looking at? How do you afford that time and make that happen? Uh, yes, sir. So two, two ways or two, two sort of initial comebacks. And, and to your, so, so to your point, when I, when I was in the War College, I studied RASP graduation rates. RASP graduation rates plummeted between about like 2016 to 2019. They went from about 53% down to 25%. And what we found, there was a series of interventions that the Ranger Regiment did sort of unknowingly. We stumbled through it. But, but this was one of them. And they started to give young, young Ranger students um, a book to, to sort of journal. In all truth, we, we have not, I just, we just haven't been able to get that off the ground. Um, however, a pretty, a pretty deliberate focus on counseling, that sort of resonated better with the SAR majors. You know, like you show up with like a, a book from the Ranger Regiment, not everybody loves that. But, but you like sort of hammer home program of record counseling and, and that sort of resonates quite a bit. And then I got a book yesterday um, from the 197th that also has has some, some, some journaling aspects tied directly to, uh, to doing hard things. I th think we'll use that as a model going forward. Yeah, perfect. I mean, the Sergeant Major and I were having the same conversation. You can do it in formal or informal counseling. We already have a process for that. That's Let's right. sit down with these individuals and even document it for, you know, that's, that's wonderful. Okay. All right. Any other questions? 